I'm Alex Mosed, and welcome to Winner Take All, where we talk about the constant battle against big tech monopolies and how to fight back against the big tech monopolies and win. In that fight, it may seem dreary at times, but don't worry, we will win and we are making a lot of progress. Uh, one of Applico's ways to contribute to that battle is to help large enterprises accelerate their own digital initiatives by doing deals with other tech companies, not the tech monopolies, but up and coming tech companies. And so uh, we had some exciting news come out recently about a client, Dot Foods, acquire a company called Shop Hero. Uh, you can see the press release here. Um, Dot Foods is North America's largest food industry redistributor. What a redistributor is, they buy from a lot of manufacturers and food suppliers. And then they actually sell to other food distributors, right? So they're actually a step in between from manufacturer to distributor. Announces that the acquisition of Shop Hero, a leading grocery-focused e-commerce technology company with the support of platform consultancy firm Applico. This is a really great story. Dot Foods is a really interesting company. Shop Hero, also a really interesting company. Coming together to... You know, provide more digital solutions uh, for, in this case, you know, the grocery customers of Dot Foods, right? So, who who is that? That is grocery stores and other kind of grocery wholesalers. Uh, so, it's not so much there's the food service part of the business, and then there's the grocery part of the business. So, this is really focusing on the grocery part of the business, and then um, ultimately, what are grocers doing? Grocers are selling to uh, the end consumer, and so. What Dot is helping to do here is helping to enable their customers, in this case, the grocery retailers and the grocery wholesalers, with technology, e-commerce capabilities, uh, extra inventory and product catalog expansion, product data, all of these things that marketplaces and tech monopolies are very, very good at doing and deploying for themselves. How can Dot help enable the smaller players, many of whom are Dot's customers, with similar kinds of technological assets? And I think this is a really interesting example of Dot saying, hey, we know our customers need this help. We know we aren't in the best position to do it ourselves. We can do a lot of great things on our own, but we recognize that we have a gap. And this company, Shop Hero, can fill that gap and help our customers and overall Dot have a more holistic and comprehensive value prop and, and, and solution for Dot's customers. The great thing about this is what you typically see with tech monopolies is they will often do the same thing, right? They will give away technology. They will subsidize that um, kind of software value in exchange for the network and, and, and capturing the network. Everyone knows how that script gets played out is the tech monopoly gives you a bunch of free stuff up front. You, you adopt, you get addicted, and then eventually they cram you down on margins or they cut you out of the transaction altogether. Hmm, who does that pretty well? Oh, small company by the name of Amazon um, and a bunch of other tech monopolies. That's why um, you know we talk about regulation all the time on the show. But anyway, the great thing about what our clients and Dot Foods in this case can help do um, is provide similar kinds of capabilities, if not better better capabilities, because it's intertwined with the existing services that Dot is already providing. But the but the special part is. That's not here to screw all these grocery customers and, and these existing customers of Dot, which ultimately is what the tech monopolies will end up doing when you play the script out, you know, all the way down, you know, three, five years down the road, right? They're ultimately going to cram you down and try to cut you out. Why? Because the tech monopolies like an Amazon ultimately want to go to who? The supplier, the manufacturer. We've seen this a myriad of times on Amazon B2C, right? So coming from an incumbent, coming from a company that you can trust like Dot, to me is a no-brainer if you're that grocery retailer, if you're that you know, smaller grocery wholesaler, right? And you say, do I want this stuff from a tech monopoly um, or, or even to some extent, you know, a, a VC-backed company that I know has to go public and I know the VCs have invested in the winner-take-all business model that means that ultimately I'm going to get crammed down sometime in the future. Or do I want, you know, a similar, if not better, holistic solution from the traditional enterprise that I know and I can trust? 
I think you're going to see a lot more of these decisions, not just in the dot foods example, but in a, in a bunch of different examples where you're starting to see traditional enterprise team up with up and coming tech companies, right? Up and coming tech companies are being crammed down by the tech monopolies just as much, if not more, as the traditional enterprises are being crammed down. How do we help bring both of these worlds together to fight back and win? against the tech monopolies. And Dot Foods acquiring Shapiro is a great example of that. Other thing that we just also released was Applico's top 50 B2B marketplace ranking. You can, you can see the uh, overview article here on MDM. Uh, MDM is the Modern Distribution Management. It's a, it's a top uh, uh, publication in the B2B industry. Um, we have ranked the top 50 B2B marketplace startups these are independent startups. So yes, you know some of the big ones have a lot of VC money. A lot of them have VC money in general. But um, you know, a couple interesting takeaways in in this article. I'll sh I'll show you the the PDF which you can download for free. The top fifty B two B marketplaces aggregate GMV is between seventy five to one hundred billion dollars uh, by our calculations compared to Amazon Business that we know is at twenty five billion dollars. So. Amazon Business is still the largest singular B2B marketplace out there. But when you add it all up and you and you look at this, right, it it is nowhere near as dominant. If you if you if you were to look at this chart um, in B2C, it would actually be inverted, right? It would be Amazon B2C marketplace on the left, and then everyone else on the right. It is still a very different scenario in in the B2B distribution world, which by the way, is the largest industry in the United States, six to eight trillion dollars in size. And what we want to do, what Applico is trying to do, what a lot of people are trying to do, is to help prevent what Amazon has done to B2C happen to B2B. If that happens, it's just very bad for pretty much like everyone involved, except for Amazon. It's bad ultimately for the business customers. It's bad for the suppliers. It's bad for distributors. How can you offer a better solution to the business customers before Amazon business really gets to scale and then basically destroys the rest of the supply chain as we've seen them do um, in B2C and, and, and wreak havoc. So here's the list. You can see this, you know, it's a, it's a little bit fuzzier here, but you can see also the list here. If you go get the report, then you'll have, you know, a bunch more insights that we have. We break out, um, you know, who are the top uh, top 10 venture capital firms investing in B2B marketplace. Uh, by vertical, what are the top um, industries, right, that have raised money in B2B distribution and how many startups are in those verticals? What is the average valuation versus average capital raised by vertical, right? So a lot of interesting ways to break this down. Um, you know, what are the top industries that have unicorns uh, that are doing over a billion dollars in GMV or over ten billion dollars in GMV, and then we give you a huge long list with here's the full list of companies, what vertical they're in, how much money they've raised, and then some overview insights and takeaways. It's a really great report. The team worked really, really hard on this. The B two B marketplaces, we all need to try and support them, whether it's as a customer, as a supplier, as an investor. The more these B two B marketplaces are successful, the more equity and balance we will have in B2B distribution, which is very important for a lot of basically the US economy. Check those two things out. Really study that B2B marketplace list if you're anywhere in the B2B world. Um, really good research there. Actually, interesting news is one of the uh, companies on the top 10 was just acquired. Lightspeed is acquiring. Lightspeed is a, a big point of sale company. Um, they are acquiring New Order. New Order is in the top 10 uh, on our list. Multi-billion dollar company. Um, wow. So, well, uh, one of the top 50 is already gone. So now there are only 49. Um, but New Order was a very, still is a very interesting company. If you look at, you know, what they're providing in the fashion space for, um, you know, they have a partnership with Nordstrom that just popped up here. They're being acquired by a point of sale company. So you have this integrated end to end solution. It's really interesting if you, if you dig into why this transaction came about, this graphic is really cool. Lightspeed, you know, is, is in the store with all the fashion boutique retailers. And now they just bought the back end, the fashion B2B marketplace, which is 
where all these retailers are are sourcing their product and their inventory from. So they now have a, a tightly bundled end-to-end solution for these boutique fashion retailers. And even though you know New Order is also working with big players like Nordstrom. A lot of other people are also already looking at our B2B top 50 list, like Lightspeed. Um, so <clears throat> on to the set agenda. First topic is what inflation might you ask? I don't, you know, I'm just gonna just gonna wave my magic wand and there is no inflation. Oh, who is talking about inflation? Why would there ever be inflation? Um, that was what the Fed has been telling us for months. That's what Janet Yellen has been telling us for months. Oh, don't worry about inflation. There's no inflation. On the show, we have said that is complete bogus. Inflation is coming. I have given you multiple examples about how and why inflation is coming. We've had the chief economist of Lending Tree on the show. He didn't agree with me about inflation, inflation, but he did agree with me about asset price inflation, which is um, basically investment assets, so stocks, equities. Um, and we talked a lot about our uh, uh, private, you know, tech company valuations also seeing inflation. Now, a little update on that. So you're absolutely seeing real inflation, like in everyday consumer goods inflation, um, whether or not the federal government and the Fed want to admit it. And we're going to talk more about that in a second. But let me talk to you about um, tech company inflation. So we released, Applico released a report end of last year saying, hey, we're seeing inflation um, with late stage VC uh, investments, right? So later stage kind of growth stage tech companies, right? And we talked a lot about why we saw that coming about. Well, fast forward to 2020, you know, we're, we're now almost halfway through 2021. And basically it's gotten a lot worse. Not only has it spread even deeper inflation into late stage, it is now spread into early stage, going down even to angel and seed rounds. I mean, look at this. You're seeing inflation in angel and seed rounds having record-breaking uh, both valuations and dollars being put into early stage companies. See this here, early stage VC. Look at that. Lines go up. I'm going to talk more about why this is happening in a second after I show you the, you know, what's happening. Now let's look at the late stage. Look at late stage. Oh, oh my, oh, yikes. Look at that. So we caught it, right? So our report was looking at, you know, this bit. You know, the second half of 2020, we were saying, yeah, we see inflation in the late stage. Look. Look at what just happened. Look at the line going basically straight up. This is, the, this is what every startup wants to see in their growth chart, right? This is the proverbial hockey stick, right? Boom. Yeah, but uh, I mean, I guess every startup also wants to see this with inflations and, and, and in valuation and, and dollars going into late stage VC rounds. But this chart is specifically looking at late stage VC pre-money valuations. Um, by quarter. So this is the Q1 2021 average. Now, what does this mean? What this means and why this is happening is we saw, Applico reported on this, we saw the beginnings of late stage inflation and valuation second half of 2020. Now, and what we attributed that to was a lot of the like, um, uh, kind of like, hedge fund, really kind of like gross stage, pseudo PE kind of funds were investing in uh, a flight to safety. They were investing in late stage tech companies um, that were bigger. They could plow, put their money in. It was safer. You know, we're still kind of in the throes of COVID. We were also in the middle of, you know, kind of SPAC mania was just getting going, right? So, hey, let me give you some money. Hey, go SPAC it. And then I get liquidity on the public market. Now what's happening Q1 is that ocean has been boiled. That ocean is actual, actually boiling. The late stage VCs have gotten crammed down because now you have these bigger funds that are used to writing bigger checks going and, and going to the later stage uh, kind of gross stage tech companies saying, hey, let me put money in. I'll write, I'll give you more money. 
and I'll give you a higher valuation. So take my money. Don't take the late stage VC's money. Take my money. And the and the founder is saying, okay, yeah, let's do that. And now you had all the late stage VCs are getting effectively crammed down. And then the late stage VCs are, you know, doing deals in the late stage, but now they're also going into the early stage. So now you have the early stage investors that are doing series A and series B. Now they've gotten crammed down and now they're going into the seed. Oh, so you see how this whole thing cascades down, right? So it started, you know, and it takes time. That's why to the point on inflation, by the time it hits the consumer, it's trickled down, right? It, you know, it just, it doesn't happen overnight. That's why I've given you stories about uh, our clients, many of whom are in the B2B distribution world anonymously, but saying that they are seeing that inflation in their business, right? So if you think about the supply chain, goes from manufacturer to B2B distributor to, um, you know, then retail stores and, and the consumer. It's a couple steps above in the supply chain, which means that by the time it hits the consumer, there's a little bit more time. And, but all that stuff gets passed down. It all cascades down. Whether you're talking about late stage inflation in, in private tech companies down to early stage, which is what we're seeing now, um, or you're talking about inflation from manufacturers and suppliers going to B2B distributors and eventually making their way to the consumer. It is all happening. So that means that when <clears throat> you, know, you are supposed to trust the powers that be who were saying that inflation is not here, it's not a thing, you know, now they're kind of changing their tune um, like this. Yellen admits inflation is about to surge, but, but, but don't worry. It will be a plus for society's point of view. What the hell does that mean? Increased inflation could ultimately be a net positive for the U.S. economy and large government spending won't overheat the economy. If Janet Yellen was Pinocchio, her nose would be through that microphone. Like the microphone would be off the stage, on the floor. Like you actually wouldn't even be able to hear her anymore because she would have disabled the mic because her nose would be so long. It's just not true. It's just not true. You know, now, now what, now what the, these experts, right, uh, will tell you is that, oh, well, inflation might reach 5%, but then it's going gonna, it's gonna to taper down. Inflation's going to come down, right? Uh, because we had a, a little surge because the economy is opening back up again, but inflation's going to come back down. Uh, I think they said inflation is at like 5% now. U.S. inflation is highest in 13 years as prices surge 5%. It's not coming back down. Nothing is being done to fix this. My clients, they can't hire people. The labor markets are a mess. You can't hire people anymore. You just got all the wages extended until September unemployment wages, all of this, right? It all cascades down. Nothing is being fixed at the source, right? All the stuff that's happening at the source, it's not, it's not like, oh, now inflation has finally hit the consumer. Oh, 5%? You know that the, the Federal Reserve is supposed to have an inflation target of 3%. Like five, we just, we went from basically, oh, no inflation to 5%. And now it's magically going to come back down. It doesn't work this way. And I see it at the source and the source is not getting fixed. The source is going crazy because they can't get labor. Prices are going up for commodities on every, basically every category. And the source is saying, yeah, this isn't getting fixed. And I am only seeing more inflation, which means this 5% number is not going down. No one is doing anything to actually fix this problem. It's not going to get fixed. Boom, look at this. Yikes. No bueno. Now, why is inflation bad? Inflation is bad because <clears throat> the Federal Reserve's objective, like stated objective, their raison d'etre is to control inflation. And they have a target of 3% inflation. So eventually the bubble is going to pop here in the sense that the Fed and the Federal Reserve are printing money like it's their job. They are doing quantitative easing like it's their job. They are racking up a fiscal budget deficit like it's their job. And man, so far, all these people are very good at their jobs. 
And eventually the thing that makes the music stop is inflation because if effectively you've got a decision to make, right? I either have to stop juicing the money supply to control inflation or I don't and I and then inflation continues to get even worse. And once inflation reaches a tipping point, you get hyperinflation and and it, and it just you can't put the genie back in the box, essentially. That's a really, really bad scenario. You know, if you listen to your parents like the 70s, yeah, inflation was crazy. Yeah, that's hyperinflation. And then you have like stagnation where you have flat GDP growth or you have recession, depression, negative GDP growth. And oh, yeah, hyperinflation, recession. That is the perfect storm. That is what we had Jim Rickards on the show to talk exactly about this exact thing which is why he said to put, you know, and he talks about how to invest your money differently to prepare for these exact events. Buckle up, go watch some of our videos, go watch the Jim Rickards video. Um, it is happening and no one is doing anything to fix it. And, and, and who knows? And if the Fed does decide to stop quantitative easing, what you're going to see in the stock, the stock market is going to tank. Stock market is going to crash. And a whole bunch of other things are then going to start to come apart. So what do you do? You, you keep giving out free money and just let the music keep playing, knowing that it's going to be a lot worse. Go look at Japan. Go look at Japan in the late 80s. Great documentary. I talked about it um, earlier on the show. I think Princes of the Yen was the documentary. Yep. Princes of the Yen. It's on YouTube. It's free. Go watch that thing right now. Okay. What else were we told this same thing about? Oh, yeah. Um, the COVID origin story. Um, I was just talking about Jim Rickards. We had Jim Rickards on the show. He wrote a book, The New Great Depression. Go read that book. And in the book, what he said, and he came on the show, and what he said is, I read 100 scientific uh, papers um, through July of 2020. That's when he finished writing his book. And I read 100 uh, papers on it. And I've concluded, and he put it in this book, that the virus came from a lab. You don't know the kind of heat that we got for having that opinion on our show on YouTube. To have someone come on the show and say that the virus came from a lab. Oh, I mean, and, and I also agreed with him. Of course, it came from a lab. It didn't come from a bat or a pangolin, although I love South Park. Um, there's no way it came from a bat or a pangolin. Are you kidding me? Um, and... Here is where, you know, I was having 1984 before on the book. Um, and, in, you know, one of the things that happens in the book 1984 is, you know, Big Brother goes and, and literally changes history to fit the, the narrative. Um, look at this example. This is Tom Cotton. Like, I think he's senator of Arkansas, something like that. This is a February 2020 Washington Post headline. Keeps repeating a coronavirus conspiracy theory that was already debunked, which is that the virus came from a lab, which it came from Wuhan. And there's a level, whatever it is, three or four virology lab, 10 kilometers from Wuhan. And hmm, like maybe this could have come from a lab. And then June 2021, same article, same photo. Like the Washington Post actually has people on staff that are going in and changing these headlines. That is literally the main character in 1984. That's literally his job. The main character in the book, 1984, Winston, he goes back into the newspapers and changes the headlines and the text of the newspapers to fit the current narrative. Whoever you are, Winston, at the Washington Post, you should resign because you're doing the devil's work. Tom Cotton keeps repeating a coronavirus fringe theory that scientists have disputed. So it went from conspiracy theory that was already debunked to fringe theory that scientists have disputed. Good job, Winston. Really good work. Now, another, <clears throat> this is Fauci's emails. You know how we covered that Google demonetized a lot of these sites that were talking about where the virus came from? Look at this, right? And we talk about how, uh, you know, Fauci and Facebook have been coordinating. We talked about um, Facebook's algorithms to, uh, you know, to silence users that are labeled as vaccine hesitant on Facebook. What virology lab? You know, it's like a, like I'm a Jedi. It's like they're a Jedi. I'm going to wave my hand. What virology lab? 
Forget that. No virology lab here. Keep going. Right? It doesn't work that way. Americans and people are not stupid. Can't treat us like we're stupid. We're not, you know, who, who is it? That, we're not stormtroopers. Okay. I don't have a stormtrooper up here. I got R2 up here. Ray can control the stormtroopers. Uh, Obi-Wan can control the stormtroopers. People, Americans, people around the world are not stormtroopers. You can't pull this. We're smarter than that. We're all waking up about how big tech and big government have overstepped their boundaries and we need to rein that in and we are making progress. I'm going to touch on that uh, a little bit later here. So, uh, okay. Twitter is a mess. I got so much stuff on Twitter. Um, where do I even start with Twitter? I'm going to get to the Nigeria thing second. The first thing I got to start with Twitter is Twitter subscription plan generates yawn from Wall Street for $3 a month. That's it, folks. $36 a year. Hardcore Twitter users can get what could only be described as minor enhancements, says the information, such as the ability to undo a tweet within 30 seconds of sending it. And Twitter thinks this is going to generate 700 to $800 million. That's because Jack Dorsey should not be CEO of Twitter. <laughs> Jack Dorsey needs to go do Bitcoin, and he talks about that. We've talked about how Twitter is horrible leadership, horrible management. Um, now Twitter has come out with the way they're going to reinvent their business, and get a bunch of revenue growth, and it is complete trash. And the numbers don't even make any sense because Twitter only has like 3 million uh, power users in the United States. They say they got 36 million um, you know, monthly active users. Best case scenario, 10% of those are actual power users. So Twitter says, yeah, we're going to charge $3 a month and make $700 million. You run the math out and you say, okay, well, if you got half of your power users, 1.5 million people to sign up for this bogus premium plan, you would make, guess how much? 1.5 million users times, 30, times $36 is a grand total of $54 million. Now, how do you close the gap between $700 million and $50 million? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. And I'm pretty sure Jack Dorsey doesn't know either because Jack Dorsey is just dreaming about Bitcoin. Jack Dorsey is going to the Bitcoin conference in Miami and saying, Bitcoin changes absolutely everything. I don't think there's anything more important in my lifetime to work on, clearly, because Twitter's new revenue plan is complete garbage. In fact, if I were not at Square or Twitter, I would be working on Bitcoin. If Bitcoin needed more help than Square or Twitter, I would leave them for Bitcoin. So he's saying Square and Twitter need him, need him, it's all about him, our deity, Mr. Dorsey. Um, Square and Twitter need him more than Bitcoin needs him. So it's okay. It's okay, everyone. Bitcoin's going to be okay. Um, but I believe both companies have a role to play, whatever that means. We all know where Jack Dorsey's heart is, and it is with Bitcoin. Whatever I can do, whatever my companies can do to make Bitcoin more accessible to everyone is how I'm going to spend the rest of my life. Jack Dorsey's point is that, that Bitcoin is, and, and crypto helps level the playing field for you know, emerging countries, third world countries, where when you have things like inflation, those countries and, and their currencies really don't end up in a good situation when that kind of stuff happens. So that's why you just saw El Salvador actually accept Bitcoin as tender, not only for inflationary fears, which, which the president didn't address, but he was addressing more about um, sending and receiving remittance, remittances because they have a lot of people who have come to the United States and are sending money back to El Salvador. And there's a lot of fees to send and receive money back and forth between the US and El Salvador. And Bitcoin helps to alleviate a lot of those fees for their people. So they have now um, actually accepted Bitcoin as tender. You can actually like pay the El Salvadorian government with Bitcoin. Um, and, it's, and it's a huge step forward for Bitcoin. Really is a great I, I, I truly do think it's really a great step forward for Bitcoin, for emerging countries, for third world countries to embrace a separate currency than their own, because not only for transferring money and remittances, but because for the other point we were just talking about, 
inflation is coming. Big inflation is coming. It's actually already here. Winter is coming. Um, and it's already already here. So anyway, Jack Dorsey should have been kicked out by Elliot, his activist investor, months ago. Jack Dorsey has a horrible management team underneath him. So I think he's kind of held Elliot hostage. They don't know what to do. You probably saw what Nigeria did, which is genius, is they banned Twitter. This is exactly what needs to start happening. And then you want to know what Twitter's response was. This was Twitter's response. Twitter declares access to its platform a human right. Yeah, I mean, you can't make it up, right? Like, it's not even just about conservatives, which is what this article is talking about. They've banned people in the crypto world. They've banned people uh, for religious reasons. They've banned people for so many reasons. And there's a bunch of partisan issues at Twitter, too. That's a very objective statement. But now Twitter is saying, oh, well, access to our platform is a human right. So like Nigeria, you gotta, you, gotta, you can't ban us. Do they not recognize their own hypocrisy? They don't. They don't. Which is really just shows how big the problem is that they view that what they're doing as righteous, right? They view what they're doing as kind of like God's work. Um, and that is, ladies and gentlemen, the true definition of crazy. It is when... The definition of crazy is when you don't think you're crazy, but you are crazy. But you think that you are perfect, perfectly reasonable and logical, right? Like what you are doing is righteous, right? What you are doing is, is good for society, but you're actually crazy. That's Twitter. So it's amazing that Twitter was banned. I hope other countries do the same thing until Twitter truly um, recognizes that they are silencing free speech, that they are taking away um, a human right of access. <clears throat> and to that point, you have Ohio, which is suing Google to have it declared as a public utility, which why this is a big deal is because, well, A, this is actually what we've talked about on the show for years which is that you need to treat these things like public utilities, kind of like banks and railroads and uh, telecommunications like AT&T. And Justice Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court, actually, in his dissenting opinion, um, Clarence Thomas suggested to go down this route to declare the tech monopolies of public utility as a mechanism to rein in their overbearance and over censorship and taking advantage of who? Producers, right? It's producers that get taken advantage of. It's the Nigerian president, where even if the guy is corrupt, even if the guy is a complete horrible leader, do you think that the Nigerians are too dumb to figure that out? Do you think that the Nigerians are sheep? Do you think that people can make up their own minds? And you know what? The platforms don't get it right. As we have seen with crypto, where they've banned crypto uh, across all the tech monopolies. We had Peter uh, Saddington on the show, the crypto investor. He had his show ripped off of YouTube, hundreds of thousands of subscribers. No notice, no warning, no nothing. This isn't just a political thing. This is, a, or COVID, right? The virus coming from a lab. Oh, now we can talk about it coming from a lab, but we couldn't talk about it. Couldn't even talk about it coming from a lab Certainly in 2020, we got into hot water talking about it in January of 21. Let people be free. Let people speak their opinion. Let people make up their own minds. And this Ohio suit, I think, is a great, um, a great track that actually has not been explored in the United States before. Attorney generals are waking up. People are waking up. The tech monopoly power will be reined in and is slowly being in, reined in. It may take a little bit longer than all of us would hope, but it's happening. People are getting smart to this. And everyone can take action in their own little way, and we will win this battle. Um, and whether now, okay, the one last thing on Nigeria, which is interesting, is I'm pretty sure that so. Um, yeah, so uh, Nigeria <clears throat> uh, 
Nigeria was one of the com- countries in Africa that was importing Chinese tech through the Belt and Road Initiative, the tech firewall, all the stuff that China uses to, you know, the great firewall um, in China. Nigeria is one of the companies, uh, countries in Africa. We've talked about how China has been exporting the great firewall tech to Russia and Africa. Nigeria is one of those countries in Africa. Nigeria has very close relations with China. And so the irony in all of this is that I agree with Nigeria's decision to ban Twitter because someone needs to put Twitter in its place. And these, even though Twitter is not a tech monopoly, these platforms are overstepping their boundaries and someone needs to fight back against them. So I am supportive of that. The irony in all of this is that Nigeria is using China's tech, their great firewall tech, to actually uh, implement the ban on Twitter. Nigeria reportedly, reportedly meets China to control access to social media, VPNs, and others. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. You know, what do you do? I don't know. You could you never win, uh, you know, man. Um, but what, what, what's the greater evil? Twitter or China getting its technology into Africa? I don't know. Don't ask me that question. I don't want to answer that question. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's kind of it's kind of funny. Uh, I mean, it's not funny, but it's. I mean, you, what can you do? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, Twitter's a mess. Jack Dorsey is a joke. Okay, more China. So, um, you know, there's the story on Tesla, Tesla's crisis in China. Oh, China is turning against Tesla. Why would you say? We had General Spaulding on the show. Um, he said this exact thing. That China wants to control Tes- uh, Elon. China wants, you know, and, and the way China controls people and companies is through soft power. It's not hard power. It's not like kidnapping people and using weapons and force. It's saying, hey, Elon, yeah, you got a nice business in China. All your investors, yeah, they're valuing your business, Tesla, on the stock market with its sales, a lot of which are now coming from where? Oh, China. Well, Elon, what would happen if your sales tanked? Would your would your stock price tank? So Elon, like Starlink, yeah, don't play any games with Starlink. Don't don't allow Starlink to work in China. Yeah, Elon, like it'd be great if we could get involved with SpaceX. Yeah. Or, or, or your EV technology on Tesla or whatever China wants, right? They are exerting their power on Elon. Tesla's China's orders halved in May. And here's the good news. Um, that when you actually look at Tesla's stock price, yeah, it went down a little bit. But we all know Elon doesn't really care about stock prices. That's why he like nukes his own investments. And, you know, you have Tesla's stock prices up and then he says, yeah, it feels a little bit high to me. That's Elon. So... Fortunately, I don't think Elon hopefully won't read too much into this and and kowtow to our to the communist dictators over in China. Um, but you can see China's absolutely trying to exert that power. This is from the CCP, trying to exert that power and trying to, um, you know, maybe this is a little test run about um, how much power they can or cannot have over Elon. General Spaulding has great examples of of other U.S. companies that have gone into China and how China has uh, his book, Stealth War, I have it on the shelf, um, has, you know, used its soft power to basically screw over those companies and get whatever China wants out of them. So um, Spotify is partnering with a company called Storytel. Storytel is actually public. Storytel it has a bunch of audiobooks. So this is a great example of saying, hey, Spotify is trying to expand its product catalog. Spotify is saying, hey, on content and markets that are very fragmented for content, like podcasting, we want to own that on our own. We're going to spend a bunch of money, Joe Rogan, a bunch of high profile you know, creators. Um, that's one of our seven strategies to solve for the chicken and egg problem. Create a single or double-sided marquee strategy. High value users will help you attract other users who want to interact with them. Their participation on your platform brings extra value to your ecosystem. So many platforms will make specific efforts to subsidize the participation of these high value users. We saw Mixer do this with Ninja, the Microsoft's tw- uh, Twitch competitor. We've seen uh, Spotify do this with a bunch of podcasters like Joe Rogan and others. Audiobooks is different. 
audiobooks is more consolidated, right? It's not as fragmented. It's maybe not as consolidated as the music and record industry is, but it's certainly more consolidated than uh, podcasting. So Spotify is saying, yeah, I don't really need to own this, but why don't I partner with it? And um, Storytel has 1.6 million subscribers and Spotify has 158 million. So they literally have 100 times the amount of subscribers. Storytel gets access to the scale of Spotify. Spotify gets access to the product and the data and the technology and the content of Storytel. And Spotify gets there much faster with less CapEx. It's not a super, super strategic thing that Spotify needs to own. <clears throat> Instead, partner with it. Both parties can win. And you know, Spotify now has a more holistic, a more comprehensive offering for its customer. This is literally the script that Applico brings to large traditional enterprises to say, do you really need to own that company or should you just partner with it, get to that digital business model, that digital future state much faster with less CapEx, less execution risk, and a much faster timeline? Yeah, let's do that. That is what Spotify is doing here. I think this is a great example. Very smart decision. I really love the moves that Spotify is making. Last topic. Roblox gets Gucci. So we talked about <clears throat> Roblox's, uh, Gucci's kind of partnership with Roblox. Gucci's bringing digital items and experiences to Roblox. Now look at this. So, you know, you have this like the Gucci room, you can go hang out in the Gucci room. And then Gucci in the Gucci garden um, is a limited two week event. They were uh, selling like Gucci products, right? And digital items into the Roblox ecosystem. And now one of those items, a virtual Gucci bag, sold for more money on Roblox than the actual bag in real life. This was on the resale market, right? So the Gucci bag originally sold for basically six US dollars. And then you had the, the secondhand, the resale market, which we've seen in real life with secondhand sneaker market, basically take it to over $4,000 to buy this digital Gucci bag, where in real life, the bag sells for $3,400. This is not an NFT, but this is what we've talked about. You know, a lot of these kind of digital platform companies like Roblox kind of have very like NFT like concepts, but it's not technically an NFT. It's just digital goods or it's digital currency or it's Robux, right? Um, it's not like a alt coin that Roblox has. It's just their own digital currency. It's not built on the blockchain. But there's a lot of similarities between Robux and altcoins, just like there's similarities between uh, Gucci's digital bag um, versus NFTs. So lots of interesting stuff with this. There's the bag with the B on it, over $4,000. That's it for us today on Winner Take All. I love you all. I will talk to you soon.